as you come to the study of Job, this marvellous book, one of the significant features of this book is the wonderful poetry, the Hebrew poetry. And I hope and pray that you enjoy this book. That I know it's a long book and uh, with the first reading or a casual reading it could seem to be so much the same and go on for so long but the power of this book of course is part of its length it is its length that's part of the power of it uh, but but also the the rich poetry and i think it would be helpful to take just a few moments to explore the poetry of job now if you uh, have been in the course and uh, for a while and you studied Psalms then uh, this will be uh, would not be new to you if you've joined the course since then then I would urge you encourage you to take time to work through this and and even if you have been with us for a while and studied poetry uh, the Psalms then this will be I think an important and a helpful review because as you read the book through, uh, engaging with the poetry and the art form in, uh, of Hebrew poetry and the various characteristics of Hebrew poetry, I think will help you to engage much more with this book and enjoy it. And so, uh, enjoy it in a, in a greater way. And so, uh, let's uh, look at Hebrew poetry Rhyme is not a part of the features of Hebrew poetry. When I was younger, I thought the reason uh, I didn't see the Psalms and other poet, poetic books rhyming was because of the translation from Hebrew to English. Uh, but that's not the case. The features of Hebrew poetry are many, but rhyme is not one of them, at least not the rhyme of sound. But there is a rhyme, and it's thought rhyme. And it was Bishop Loweth that rediscovered this feature of Hebrew poetry, which has been lost to the church for many years. And he rediscovered it in 1753. He said that uh, he, he spoke about semantic parallelism. And he said, in Hebrew poetry, there's correspondence and equity between parts of the sentence. Uh, and this is uh, what I want to begin by exploring with you. Uh, he uh, identified three different kinds of semantic parallelism. And the first he called synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism. Uh, and this is where the second line of the poetic verse repeats the thought of the first line, only in different words. And so the rhyme is not in sound, but in thought. Uh, often there's meter, too, in Hebrew poetry, which may be lost to us. But this is not lost, because this is translatable. And so there's a, a thought couplet, or sometimes a thought triplet. So let's see what this looks like in Job. Uh, before we do that, let's look at how our Bibles format Hebrew poetry. Now, it may be a little bit different in your translation. The older uh, translations don't do this. The King James, uh, for example, was before uh, was translated before Loeth uh, identified Hebrew poetry. But the more modern versions, they uh, tend to lay out Hebrew poetry very helpfully in a way that can help us identify the parallelism. So, uh, for example, uh, that is a picture there of just regular prose. The two columns uh, are uh, justified fully, both sides. But when you come to poetry, uh, you'll notice that the, uh, there's in various indentations. And the, uh, the Bible I have I will probably be very similar to yours in that there's actually three levels of indentation. There's the level to the left margin and then there's the second indentation and there's a third indentation. 
and this helps us identify the various lines of the uh, Hebrew poetry. And so the uh, line that is hard against the left margin, that is the first line of the poetic verse. Uh, but sometimes, because of the columns are narrow, that first line doesn't fit in the width of the column. And so you get there a third indentation. And when the indentation is the, the third one in there, indented twice, you know, that tells us that those words belong to that first line of the poetic verse. And then when you get the, the, that first indentation, that's an indication that it's the second line of the uh, semantic parallel uh, verse. And indeed, sometimes there's a, a third line, as we will see. And so this is uh, uh, helpful to see how the translators have formatted Hebrew poetry and uh, with, with the various lines. Okay, so uh, let's explore a synonymous parallelism. Here we have Job 4 verse 4. Your words have supported those who are stumbling. That's the first line of the poetic verse. And the second line, you'll see, repeats the thought of the first line. And you have made firm the feeble knees. The uh, phrase you have made firm is parallel to your words have supported. And the feeble knees uh, is parallel to those who were stumbling. Uh, and you see that the thought is the same even though it's described uh, differently. We have a look at another example, Job 4 verse 5. But now it has come to you and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. You can see how it touches you is parallel to but now it has come to you. And the phrase you are dismayed is parallel to and you are impatient. Uh, and so as you read this you and you know what you're looking for you will be able to identify these features. Another example, is not the fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? You can see how the phrase the integrity of your ways corresponds to is not the fear of God and your hope corresponds to your confidence. And uh, synonymous parallelism is used in Job more than any other of the books in the Bible that use poetry, uh, have the poetic form. Uh, sometimes there's three parallel lines, as in Job 3.5. Let gloom and deep darkness calm it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. And you'll see how uh, the, the first phrases all correspond. Gloom, deep darkness, clouds, blackness of the day correspond to calm it, settle upon it and terrify it. Uh, as you become familiar with this, you'll notice this over and over again. Uh, Bishop Loweth recognised a second form of parallelism which he called antithetic parallelism. Antithetic parallelism was when the two portions of the verse stand in contrast. And so synonymous, they say the same thing or, 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 or similar things. And with antithetic parallelism, the two portions of the verse stand in contrast. Uh, the second line is, is a negative statement compared with the first. And the second line often starts with but. And uh, you'll quickly realise that this is a very common uh, form of parallelism used in the book of Proverbs with the aphorisms there from chapter 10 onwards. 
but it's also used in other uh, portions of poetry and sometimes in Job. Not as much as synonymous parallelism, uh, but it's there. And here's an example, Job 5.4. I have seen the fool taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling. I have seen the fool taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling. Another example, Job 28.5. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it, it, it is turned up as by fire. And so you see a contrasting thought. Uh, sometimes you get these two combined. You get the synonymous parallelism uh, combined with antithetic parallelism. Job 4, 4 and 5. Your words have supported those who are stumbling and you have made firm the feeble knees. We've seen that this is synonymous parallelism but with the next verse, but now it has come to you and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. Though that verse too is synonymous but as you put them together they're antithetic to one another. Another example 14, 9 and 10. Yet at the scent of water it will bud and at the and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. A man breathes his last and where is he? And so again you see the synonymous parallelism in those verses but antithetic to one another. The uh, third kind of parallelism that Bishop Loweth identified was what he called synthetic parallelism. Uh, and synthetic parallelism is where the second line doesn't uh, echo the first line. It doesn't say the same thing in a different way, but rather it completes the thought of the first line. And uh, so you don't find the first part repeated at all. And the corresponding terms don't line up neatly like we've seen with synthetic parallelism. And often it expresses complementary thoughts. Uh, so, for example, in Job 4, 8, we read, As I have seen th those that plough iniquity, and then the corresponding uh, continuation, and so trouble reap the same. This is an example of synthetic parallelism. Uh, Job 4, 10, The roar of the lion the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lion are broken. And so the, uh, the, the thought of the, of the first line is taken on with the second line, synthetic parallelism. And then you get a combination, as you ha we have seen. No doubt you are the people and wisdom dies with you. That is synthetic parallelism. But, I've under, but I have understanding as well. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know such things as these? That synthetic parallelism. But together they are antithetic. Uh, Job 17, 9 to 10. Yet the righteous holds to his way. And he who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. Those two lines are synonymous. But you come on again, all of you, and I shall not find a wise man among you. That is synthetic. But together they are antithetic in their relationship. And so uh, the art of parallelism, the art form of parallelism, is that there's balance and symmetry between the, the lines. And as you read it, it, 
it increases the impact of the statement. Uh, Hebrew poetry is not meant to be uh, read at, at a fast rate, kind of speed reading, but rather a little bit slower, thoughtfully, uh, picking up the beat and reflecting on the, the parallelism. There is of course freedom within the form as in all art forms and therefore there's always variations. And with synonymous parallelism it's if the writer is saying I want you to see this and then he turns it to a different angle and says now look at it from this different way. It's the same thing but it's seen uh, from a way that is slightly different. Uh, it's not monotonous, but the key is meditation, otherwise it could seem a bit like that. And the two lines together, where the, wh whatever it is, synthetic, antithetic, or synonymous, these two lines together say more than each one on their own. Uh, there's other poe uh, poetic devices that uh, you, you will notice in Job and in Hebrew poetry. Uh, one is chiasm, uh, particularly in lines. Uh, so, for example, you have a synonymous uh, verse and uh, the, the lines are actually uh, in reverse in the, the second line. So, uh, for example, I could encourage you with my mouth, Job 16.5. The second line is, and the solace of my lips would assert your pain. And you see how uh, the two uh, elements in the second line have been reversed. And uh, with my mouth corresponds to the solace of my lips. I would encourage you corresponds to uh, would assert your pain. Job 17.13 If I hope for Sheol as my house, if I make my bed in darkness, and you can see that there's been a reversal there of the second line. Another thing to look for in Hebrew poetry is the refrain. And that is a repeated phrase or verse, and it's repeated for effect. An example of this is in this magnificent poem of wisdom in Job 28, 12 through 20. Verse 12, But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Verse 20, uh, From where then does wisdom come, and where is the place of understanding? And this uh, adds an emphasis uh, and increases the effectiveness of that poem there on wisdom, which is seeking to discover where do we get wisdom. And there in chapter 8 it is in such a crucial place in the book of Job. Another feature of Hebrew poetry is the ellipsis. The ellipsis is where there's an element of one line omitted, but it's understood to apply. Uh, and uh, this is usually in synonymous parallelism. Uh, so, for example, Job 4.4, 4, Your words have supported those who are stumbling. You have made firm the feeble knees. And the corresponding term for your words is missing from the second line. An example there, if it was to be pure synonymous parallelism, uh, could be and your speech has made firm feeble knees. But when there's an ellipsis, that first element is missing in the second line. Another example, Job 4.7. Think now, who that was innocent ever perished? Or, where were the upright cut off? And the corresponding term in the second line, think now, is missing. Uh, maybe, if it was to be completely synonymous, it would be, or consider, where were the upright cut off? But that first element is missing, and this is a poetic device known as an ellipsis. And you will recognize this as you learn to observe these things. 
Now, uh, I've devised some symbols to help me with my study as I'm uh, reflecting on the Hebrew poetry. And I have a pencil and I just put these little symbols by the verses and this may help you. Synonymous uh, parallelism is an arrow pointing in one direction because the two lines are saying the same thing. Antithetic parallelism uh, are uh, two arrows pointing to one another because they are in contrast. And then synthetic parallelism is uh, two arrows because there's two things that are being said. If this helps you, I would encourage you to use it. Likewise, uh, using arrows crossed when there is a chiasm in the lines. Uh, or a refrain put in the verse numbers uh, at the uh, bottom of the chapter and the ellipsis is the sign there circle with a line through it. Uh, I found this helpful and if you do please uh, I encourage you to use these symbols. Now I'd like to talk about another element of uh, Hebrew poetry and in fact all poetry and that is the power of images. I want to stress this because it is so easy for us to read quickly and miss the power of what's going on with, the, uh, with images in, in poetry. One of the differences between poetry and prose is its reliance on images and figures of speech. All that we've learned about figures of speech from the first uh, unit is really important when it comes to poetry. Uh, if we consider the, uh, the contrast of poetry and prose, and, and prose is just uh, regular writing, if we think of the Bible and we think of the subject of godliness with prose, you may have a paragraph or a chapter explaining godliness. So, for example, Paul speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. Or Jesus, in speaking to the Pharisees, he speaks about how out of the heart comes those uh, wicked things in Matthew chapter 5, for example. Uh, when it comes to narrative, that is story, uh, the way godliness is communicated is often through a character which exhibits godliness in action. It could be Daniel there in Daniel chapter 1, or Joseph in the book of Genesis. Or sometimes a negative uh, example. Uh, such as, as Manasseh and the condemnation of that. But the poet, when the poet speaks about godliness, uh, he would use images or figures of speech. And so in both Psalm 1 and Psalm 92, the righteous is identified as a tree uh, that is uh, by a stream of water there in Psalm 1, or in the house of the Lord in Psalm 92. And this tree is, is full of leaves and fruit and, and uh, being a blessing. And so uh, poetry tends to use images to communicate what is being said. Now this places a greater demand on the reader than straightforward prose. And it requires a more contemplative approach because you have to reflect on what does this image mean, what is being said through this. And it requires a more continuous interpretation. When the poet writes, the poet formulates reality in images. And uh, so let's just reflect on this for the moment here. Some examples. In Job 16, uh, verse 12 to 14, these images, as we reflect on them and let them affect us, bring uh, a strong emotion because they're very violent. Uh, this is Job speaking in chapter 16. I was at ease, but he broke me apart. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. Imagine that. Oh, what, a, what, a, what an awful image. He set me up as his target. His archers surrounded me. And just think of that. Job standing in the middle 
and all people with, with their arrows being shot into Job. He slashed open my kidneys and does not spare. He pulls, pour, pours out my gall on the ground. Imagine that picture. He breaks me with breach upon breach. He runs upon me like a warrior. You see, these, these images are meant to be contemplated and the pain and the heartache and the suffering, it, 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 it we're meant to feel it and not just think it. That is the purpose of images in poetry. Now, there's lots of metaphors and similes. This is another way of communicating an image. Uh, for our purposes, the differences between the two are minor. Uh, the simile uses the word like, uh, the word such as like or as. Uh, it's a direct comparison and the metaphor doesn't use that. Uh, it's an indirect comparison, uh, but uh, both are declaring that something is like something else in some way. For example, 6.15 my brothers are treacherous as torrent bed, as a torrent bed, as torrential streams that pass away. Now this is Job complaining, and he complains that these comforters are as unstable, as insecure as this picture. Now of course we need to interpret the picture. We need to understand what a torrent bed is and a torrential stream. And a torrent bed is a stream that's in flood. But it can be flood and it's dangerous and uh, it can be overwhelming and then it can disappear. It, 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 the flood goes and there's nothing left. In fact, the, the stream can be empty like a wadi. And so he complains. Uh, and this is a... A, a, a sad picture, uh, but it's a metaphor of his comforters. Job 20, uh, this is uh, Zophar speaking and he is uh, speaking about the wicked. Uh, this, this classic idea that the wicked are always punished, the point he's making. And in speaking about the wicked, he uses this, these similes in chapter 27 and 8. He will perish forever like his own dung. Now that's a, a graphic picture. Uh, those who have seen him will say, where is he? In other words, the, the wicked is just going to disappear. He will fly away like a dream and not be found. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. Very powerful similes. We all know what it's like to have a dream and then wake up and, and we have absolutely no idea what we dreamed. It is completely gone. It's a simile. It's a very powerful simile. And so with images uh, and similes and metaphors there's two, two activities required for us to make the most of these, engage with them. And the, the first is to experience the image. In other words, we have to let the power of it, it affect us. And sometimes if it's something we're unfamiliar with, we need to understand what the image is actually saying, like the torrent beds. And, and then after we've experienced, we interpret it. What is it that the author is trying to say? and communicate through that image. Now the author is taking a risk because the author who uses, the poet who uses images, metaphors, similes, what they're doing is they're actually giving over the interpretation to the reader. And this puts a greater demand on us and we have to realize that with all images and metaphors there's limits. Uh, the, the, the image shouldn't be taken to an extreme. So for example we could talk about uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, what a powerful metaphor that is. Uh, but the psalm explains how that metaphor should be taken because we consider that a shepherd raises sheep so they could be killed for food. 
and that isn't something that's in view there but rather the care and the protection and the provision of the shepherd and so we have to reflect on the purpose of the author in communicating that particular image and so uh, these metaphors they stir up emotions and uh, they meant to attract our attention and stimulate our imagination now this is really the power of the metaphor now i remember years ago uh, going into an art gallery and i remember looking around and being very bored but it could easily be that there was someone staring at a painting and they would be looking at the same painting when I'd finished looking at all of them. And the difference between that person and me is that they understand what they're looking at and what they're looking for. And it's my prayer that as you engage with the poetry of Job and the poetry of all of Scripture, that you'll understand what you're looking at and looking for. And so the experience will be so much richer. Your encounter with Scripture will be richer and therefore your encounter with the message and the, and the messenger of scripture, the God of scripture. And in this book of Job that is so powerful, uh, a book that addresses issues that are so need to be addressed, your engagement will be rich and deep. God bless you.